uh, I didn't really feel I had a story, a, a good illustration about worry. And so uh, God and his, and his wisdom provided us with one. And some of y'all know uh, Colby, our oldest, was in an uh, accident last night. Um, he wasn't driving, but he was hurt, you know, pretty banged up and got a big gash on his head. And I think he broke his elbow and pretty sore and all that. But it could have been a lot more serious than it was. It involved three vehicles, um, you know, speeding and a car pulled out in front and, and this and that. Uh, but but thank God nobody was killed. And, and really, as far as injuries go, it could have been a lot worse. And so naturally, our first instinct is to kick into this mode of now what do we do? We start to get concerned about, you know, damage control or, or how are we going to, how is this going to be paid for and how is this going to happen? And, and we just, all of a sudden, we just be, are flooded with worry, right? And that's like, the, that's the first thing that you do. And that's like the natural response to it. But as, as followers of Christ, it, it should be unnatural that we should have a trust and a dependence upon God that, that helps us to not be worried when these things come about. So just leading up to our text today, uh, in chapter 6, it's right there in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, a very uh, common, very popular uh, teaching of Scripture. Uh, the, the first four verses in chapter 6 deals, uh, Jesus teaches on how to, to deal with charitable deeds. And, and the, basically the gist of it was to, to not do them to be seen by others. Is that, that's the gist that was behind that. Uh, and then you move on to the next, verses 5 to 15, Jesus teaches about prayer and that's just the components and the structure of prayer. That's where he's talking about uh, the, the Lord's Prayer is what we know mostly from there. Uh, to pray in this manner. And it's key to say this, pray like this. He didn't say to pray this. Know the difference? Like this. Not to pray this, to pray like this. And in verses 16 to 18, you're moving on, it says Jesus teaches about uh, fasting. And in Baptist churches, we just kind of, I think our Bibles don't even have that. Is, is it is it got some is it blotted out? We don't even know what fasting is. We we don't we don't that's the 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 thing we don't even speak about. We skip over that. And then nineteen to twenty four, uh, leading up, Jesus teaches about priorities and uh, the idea that the, the basically it boils down to is you can't serve two masters. You either serve one or you serve the other. You love one or you hate the other, and that's what you come down to. And so today. We're going to look at uh, verses 25 to 34, and it's just centered on the idea of worry. All right. Worry. Do not worry. And so uh, just a little background is some things you may already know about worry or things you may not know. Uh, uh, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines worry as to feel or show fear and concern because you think that something bad has happened or could happen. All right. That's a very good definition. And some facts about worry. Worry affects your health. Did you know that? It affects your health. And of course, uh, according to WebMD, anybody familiar with WebMD? If you've been sick or had something come up, uh, I tell you, WebMD can be your friend or it can be your enemy. Uh, I know whenever I was diagnosed with melanoma, uh, WebMD uh, will, will make you crazy because it seems like all, you have too much information and, and it's over your head. And most of the times the information you have leads to bad you know, bad uh, conclusions. So uh, take it for what it's worth. It's, it's a good resource, but I'll just, just, just be warned. It says this about, your, uh, about worry. It says, Chronic worrying affects your daily life so much that it inter- interferes with your appetite, lifestyle, habits, relationships, sleep, and job performance. Many people who worry excessively are so anxiety-ridden that they seek relief in harmful lifestyle habits such as overeating, Cigarette smoking or using alcohol and drugs. And some physical effects include difficulty swallowing, dizziness, dry mouth, fast heartbeat, fatigue, headaches, inability to concentrate, irritability, muscle aches, muscle tension, nausea, nervous energy, rapid breathing, shortness of breath, sweating, trembling and twitching, suppression of the immune system, digestive disorders, muscle tension, short-term memory loss, premature coronary artery disease, heart attack, depression, and if untreated, suicide. If untreated, or in our case, repented of, it can lead to serious bouts of depression and ultimately suicide and suicidal thoughts. Dr. Charles Mayo of the world-famous Mayo Clinic says this, worry affects the, the circulation, the heart, the glands, and the whole nervous system. And he said this, listen, I have never met a man 
or known a man to die of overwork, but have known a lot who died of worry. Right? That's true. The second thing that we see about worry, and this is, this is where it kind of hit us, worry is sinful. You ever think about it that way? You ever think about every time we worry, we're sinning against God? Because basically what it boils down to is that we distrust the promises and providence of God. That's what it boils down to. That's why it's sinful. And it's likely the most common way that we sin. Not the greatest sin, probably the most common way that we sin is to worry. Because worry is the opposite of contentment. Right? Contentment is what we're called to be. Content in Christ and that, that God will indeed provide for us to rest in these things. So, how can we combat worry? Right, Brother Mike, you've, you've pointed this out. You've peeled back this, this scab on us. You've made this sore bleed. Now, how do we fix it? What can we do? How can we combat worry? And in today's passage, we're going to see four right ways to combat worry. We need to have the right perspective. And when I say the right perspective, that means that we, uh, the way that we view life, how we see things. And then we also need to have the right mindset, and that deals with the way that we think about life. And then thirdly, we need to have the right priorities and the way we order our life. And then finally, we need to have the right expectations. Now, what exactly do we expect out of this life? What should we expect out of this life? Right? So let's see what the text has to say. Let's look at the first one, the right perspective, verses 25 to 27. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you'll eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Powerful. The first thing we see here. In this passage in verse 25, is that life is more than stuff. Life is more than stuff, and we're bombarded with this idea, especially in America. We're a consumer culture and, and driven uh, by stuff and having more stuff and having new stuff. He says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, that uh, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. Uh, what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. And see, Jesus' audience here on the Sermon on the Mount, you can imagine uh, the, the kind of a hillside and, and covered with, with individuals there. And most of those people would be poor to middle class, probably uh, farmers or shepherds, uh, and, and, and depending on uh, just living day to day, living off the land. And, and they probably only have one set of clothing. So these are just real practical issues that they were, they were dealing with. Uh, they, they weren't asking for uh, luxuries. These were just basic needs, necessities of life. Uh, and they struggle for these things, food, water, and clothing. Uh, of course, our culture is just the opposite. I don't, I don't think, we, there, are, there are people in need, no doubt. But for the most part, uh, we're a, a blessed nation, a, a, a rich nation, a fat nation. Right? You've seen the health reports? The, the, like every year's report comes out like the obesity, like the most obese cities and most obese states per capita and those type of things. Uh, food is not an issue for us. The wrong type of food is our issue for the most part. Uh, we, we like to have the latest technology, right? the latest toys. Uh, who, who's, who's all anxious to, to, for the latest uh, iPhone 6, 7, 8, 9, 10? I'm not sure where it's at. I don't know. And maybe y'all don't care about that, but, but it's out there. You probably have people lining up already waiting for that thing, lined up you know, around the block. Uh, the latest fashions. Right? What's the, 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 the latest craze, whatever it is that comes out? We all want these things. And you see things really get sideways with some people. And look, I don't know any of y'all well enough just yet, so if this, is, if this is you, I'm not talking about anyone in particular. Hoarders. Hoarders. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever seen that show, Hoarders, on I think A&E Network? Anybody seen that? I, my, my great-grandmother was a hoarder. I didn't even know it. I thought she had a lot of junk. But, but, but she was a hoarder, and I, and I didn't realize that. That's where your mind has gotten so, so warped on, on things. You, you're, you, you view your stuff 
is more precious to you than people. Have y'all seen these shows? Have y'all watched any of them? Man, they, they, they value that, that stuff, and it's most of it's garbage over people and over relationships. So this materialism has just uh, corroded them and just consumed them. Our culture wants you to buy everything that comes out. More, uh, the latest and greatest, the newest. Let me give you a warning. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. We're called to be content. Now, uh, what this passage is not doing, it's not a, a prohibition against having nice things. Right? Having nice things isn't sinful, nor is it wrong to have nice things. Right? God is a father, and he loves to bless. Just the key is, don't let your possessions own you. All right, own your possessions. Don't let your possessions own you. That's the key. So, our identity is not found in our possessions. Our identity is found in Christ. We need to remember that. All right? Life is more than stuff. Next thing we see, in verse 26, uh, we're valued by God. We're valued by God. It says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Jesus gets practical, gives an example. Right? Now, a warning, this is not a call to be lazy. All right? Some people say, well, look, they don't do anything. They don't, they don't reap or gather nothing, and, and God provides for them, so maybe I should just lay back, and then God's going to provide for me. That's not what this is speaking about. It's not a call to be lazy. The Bible says this, a man will not work. He will not eat. All right? And here's something crazy about our culture. What I've noticed is uh, uh, that it places almost equal value on people and animals. Have y'all noticed that? Have y'all noticed that, that like, the, uh, remember the, uh, is it the organization CARE? They had the commercial where, the, where they would show the, 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 the starving children with the flies and all that stuff like that. And the music they played, I think it's, I think Sarah McLaughlin or I'll Remember You. And then they come out with a dog commercial, like the, for the, uh, uh, the, the abused animal society or whatever it is. And they're playing the same song, Won't You Please Help. And I, and I turn around, I'm expecting it to be like the care commercial, it's for dogs. So you have the same thing, the same thought on that, uh, that people are, 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 have the same value as animals. And what about pet boutiques? Anybody know about a pet boutique? Y'all, y'all ain't going to say nothing about it if you, if you do. Anybody have clothes for their dogs? Anybody going to say nothing about that either? We, we have a couple of outfits. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's a dog. It don't need clothes. That, that God give it a fur coat. It doesn't need clothes. But I'm just saying our, our minds, uh, sometimes we tend to treat our dogs like they're people. And some people would rather be around dogs than people. Right, and so all these things—that's what what talking about here—that we're more valued uh, than animals than to, to God. Jesus didn't come to redeem animals; he came to redeem people. Right, right. We're to steward animals and and and, and you know make good use and, and of animals, but they're not people. Look at Matthew uh, eighteen, eleven to thirteen, talking about our value. It says, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the other, uh, the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. All right, you see the value? It's talking about us. We're that one that strayed. We're that lost uh, sheep. And in 2 Corinthians six eighteen, it says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Right? We're valued by God. We're valued by God. Jesus uh, loved us enough to die for us. Never doubt that we are valued by God. Don't undersell yourself that. Don't buy into that. Don't think that way. Next thing we see in verse 27, worry changes nothing. I'm sure you all have all experienced that, haven't you? By worrying, it changed nothing. It may have changed, it may have, uh, changed your health, but it didn't change nothing about the situation. 
Verse 27 says, Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Uh, some of your translations may say, Can any uh, one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? They had trouble kind of translating that, but the gist is the same thing. Worry can no more change a situation than it can make you taller or live longer. All right, that's true. I mean, you think about it, 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 it doesn't. It, it can't make you uh, live longer and it can't make you taller. That's why he's saying it so far. It doesn't change anything. Of course, the opposite can be true. You can worry yourself to death, but not to life. You can worry yourself to death, but not to life. Look at Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. Most of you probably don't even have to look to this one. Yeah, it's a very uh, popular verse. It says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Right. And here's the key to all of this. Let God drive. He's not your co-pilot. He's not your co-pilot. He's not your co-anything. As a matter of fact, that's, that's horrible. That bumper sticker, that t-shirt, you know, God is my co-pilot, that's awful. If he's your co-pilot, then something's seriously wrong. All right, let God drive. He's got this. Worry changes nothing. Let's look at our second, uh, second point of the passage today. We've got to have the right mindset, right? The, the right mindset, verses 28 to 30. It says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Right. Got to have the right mindset. And that starts with we got to trust God to provide. You know, trust God to provide. Verses 28 and 29 says, So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Again, going back to the audience that Jesus is speaking to here, they probably wouldn't have owned but one set of clothes. Right? They, didn't, they didn't have closets full they didn't have many storages full of more clothes, right? Our, our culture, man, we have so much stuff. Whenever we, we, uh, we're packing up to move from Perryville to here, man, we got rid of some stuff. And you know what we still got? A lot of stuff. We still got a lot more stuff. We have so much stuff. These people wouldn't have had that. They would have had only one set of clothes. And Jesus is talking about using his analogy, the, the flowers of the field. that says they do nothing to make themselves grow. Right? They do nothing to make themselves smell nice, and they do nothing to make themselves beautiful. God does that. Right? God does that. And he used it as a, as a contrast. The people would understand King Solomon, the great King Solomon, uh, and he was, he was the epitome of extravagance. Right? He used that as a comparison. God's going to provide for us. In 1 Corinthians uh, 1 9. It says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? God is faithful. God will provide all you need to live the life he desires for you to live. You hear that? God will provide all you need to live the life he desires for you to live. Sometimes we feel like we have, we're unfulfilled or we don't have all that we need. Because we're trying to live a life that he doesn't plan for us to live. Right? He's going to provide for you what he'd have for you to live the life that he would want you to live. He will equip you for the life that he'd have you to live. Does that make sense? Right? Next thing we see in verse 30. You've got to have faith. You've got to have faith. And don't start singing that George Michael song in the back of your head. Like probably most of y'all did, sort of thinking about that. Verse 30. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And what Jesus is saying here, he's talking about the, the temporary versus the eternal. 
Right? Grass is temporary, and we being in Christ, we are eternal. And if we trust God to save us, right, we can trust God for everything else. Doesn't that, doesn't that make sense? If, if we say that we trust God to forgive us of our sins, uh, to, to, to call us as sons and daughters, uh, do, you, do you think that we should have the confidence in God to provide for our daily needs? Right. Right. Which, which is greater, providing food for, for the day or, or uh, forgiveness of sins for all eternity? Which one is greater? I think he can handle it. I think he can handle it. That's what, what he's saying here. We've got to have faith. Hebrews eleven six says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he uh, who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You ever think about that way? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Sometimes we're going to have to step out on faith. Right? We can't always wait for everything to be laid out directly in front of us, that, that all the dots aren't going to connect. Trust God. Have faith. That's what pleases God. The next thing we see, our third point to combat worry, is to have the right priorities. And this is a big one. Uh, a man back at Dutchtown used to always talk about priorities. They used to, it used to drive me nuts. I ain't going to lie to you. It actually got under my skin quite a bit because he always talked about it. Uh, but you know what? That old man was right. He was right. It's all about priorities. Priorities is, is, is huge in our lives. Verses 31 to 33. says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or, or uh, what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. All right. One of the keys to having the right priorities, the first thing we see in verses 31 and 32, stop being worldly. Stop being worldly. It's, it's, it's practical. It says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. When you were lost, you had the priorities of the rest of the world. Right? You, you, you went with the flow. Everything that the world sought after, you sought after. Right? When you're lost, you live like you're lost. You have the priorities of the lost. You don't serve God, and you have no desire to, 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 to pursue the things of God. Life was all about you. Right? Was all about you. And for some of us, it's still all about you. And that's a problem. Right? There can only be one God. Either God is God or you are God. You were the center of the universe when you were lost. That's what the world thinks. The world thinks that, that, that everything revolves around them. Everything caters to them. In Christ, you're a new person. You're not the same anymore. Not just a, a revised edition. Not just a new and improved. Not made over. New is what the Bible says. New. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You no longer live if you're in Christ. As Christians, life is no longer about you. Everything is about Jesus and his gospel. Everything. And that's a, that's a struggle, isn't it? Is that easy? I'm saying it as a fact because it is a fact. But does that, that does not make it any easier, does it? That's where that dying to yourself daily comes in. Every day we have to make a decision that, that God is first, He's the priority, not me, not my kids, not my family, not my job. Right? We have to die daily. Stop being worldly. Next thing we see is that God comes first. Verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. These things, all these things, what are, what are these things? Necessities of life. That's what he's talking about, these things. 
All these things. That they're, they're talking about the, the clothing, the shelter, the food, the water, provisions of life. These things will be added. It talks about seeking God's kingdom. Seeking God's kingdom is to lose ourselves in obedience to the Lord. That's what it's talking about. Seeking God's kingdom is spending our lives on mission. That's what that means. Seeking first the kingdom of God. When you look at it, uh, we talked about it a little bit this morning in Sunday school. Uh, so, some examples to get our minds around where our priorities are and what we're seeking after. Just look at your finances, right? Look at your finances. Is, is, your, is your money, uh, you use your money for trips and vacations or missions and meeting others' needs? Right? right? I got extra money, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a trip or vacation. Or do we look at it as, as a way that we can serve in missions or meeting needs of others? Or what about our time, right? We all have the same 24 hours a day. How do you use your time? Is it mostly used for your career and leisure? Or is it used in investing in people and making disciples? Right? That's what it means to seek God's kingdom. So, are you adding to God's kingdom or building your own? Some of us get wrapped up, get going back to that drinking the Kool-Aid, keeping up with the Joneses and having all this stuff, you know, aspire to have, you know, greatness and have all these things and, uh, you know, the perfect home and the perfect cars and the perfect kids. Are you adding to God's kingdom or building your own? And then it goes on in the passage to talk about the seeking God's righteousness just to boil that down into a nutshell, it means to seek to live holy lives. That's what it's talking about. We seek it. We strive for holiness and not for worldliness. Leviticus. All the way back in Leviticus. Anybody read Leviticus? <laughs> That's a tough read, isn't it? It's a, it's a tough read. Leviticus 20, 26. It says, And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. All right. Holiness. Good old-fashioned holiness. Not goodness. Not niceness. Holiness. Right? Holiness. Righteousness doesn't just happen by itself. We have to seek it. We have to prioritize it. All right? We know that. We know that from personal experience. And here's a little advice. If you seek God... And you will gain everything else, right? Taught all these things. But you flip it around and seek everything else, and you'll never gain God. Is that true? Right? That's true. Absolutely true. So, what matters to you most is what you will prioritize. You can say all you want all day long that, that church is first, God is first, Jesus is first. Tell everybody, everybody, everybody that don't know you will believe you. Right? But we look at your wallet, we look at your calendar, where you spend your time, what you invest in, all those things, it'll tell the truth. And the last thing we see here in our passage this morning, uh, that the, the last thing that we see uh, that'll help us to combat uh, worry is that we have the right expectations. We had verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Amen? <laughs> right? To, to, today, quit, quit focusing on so much down the road. And this isn't really a, a, a prohibition for, for planning. Planning is good. It's good to not live by the seat of your pants all the time. But don't obsess over it. Especially don't... Any of y'all like, y'all like to watch Fox News or... One of the other networks are like the, uh, Hannity or I'm not even sure the, what are they are. Those type of guys. Anybody, y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all like to watch those things? Do, y- do y'all feel refreshed after you watch that or do you feel stressed out? Turn the channel. Turn the channel. It gets your blood pressure up and, 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 it, and it drives you to sin. You begin to worry, don't you? You start to think about these things and start to obsess on them. You can't get out of your head. Here's a news flash, in case y'all hadn't realized it. We live in troubled times. 
Right? You ain't got to watch the news for that. Read your Bible. Right? It talks about these things. And, and for those of you that are like new to the faith or maybe you're kind of naive in your faith, if you thought that become a, becoming a Christian, everything in life would suddenly be wonderful, you were sadly mistaken. Right? Somebody lied to you. Right? It sold you the wrong sales pitch. I don't know whatever the, the case is. All you have to do is read your Bible. Right? Read your Bible. If you think that way, you're, you're telling on yourself because you're not reading your Bible, apparently, because it doesn't go that way uh, for, for Jesus. It didn't go well for Jesus. It didn't, get, didn't go well for the apostles. What makes you think it's going to go well for you? You special? You, you get to skip that? You don't get, you know, even the prophets in the Old Testament didn't go well for them either. Right? The key is to focus on this day. Right? Like that good one day at a time, sweet Jesus, all right? One day at a time. I love this quote I found. It says, today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? I wish I could have thought of that. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Here's the good news. One day Christ will return. And what a glorious that day that will be. All right? Until then, we live in a world infected and affected by sin. We do. Don't, don't be surprised when you turn on the news and you see violence and murder and uh, sexual abuse and uh, sex trafficking and drug addiction and on and on and on. Right? That's what, that's what a, a fallen world looks like. Heard it said this way. Expect the worst and hope for the best. Right, you ever heard that saying before? Yeah. And some will say that's being cynical. I say it's not being cynical. I say it's being realistic. It's being realistic. So, all that being said, uh, this passage, uh, it's timely. I think that, that most of us deal with worry. Almost all of us do on a daily basis. Some of us on an hourly. Sometimes it's almost minutes. Minute by minute we, we worry about things. It's unhealthy. And the most of all it's, it's sinful. So four things that we saw today to help us to combat. Four right ways to combat worry. We have the right perspective. We have the right mindset. We have the right priorities. And then we have the right expectations. So this morning, as we close, as, a, as our time to respond, our invitation time, uh, a little different today. I don't know that today is definitely a, a, a time, a, a call for uh, people to get saved, but we're always up for that. If God has moved and spoken to you about, hey, I'm, not, I'm worried about my eternity, then by all means, in the time of response, come down and talk to me. Let's, let's talk about Jesus and you getting that right. But this morning, mainly, I want to open the, the, the front up as an altar to, for us to repent of our worry. And if you're not comfortable with that, then repent right there in, in the pews, wherever you're at. But we need to do these things. Because here's the beauty of it all. 1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me pray, and then we'll have our time of response. Father, we are so grateful for Christ. We're so grateful, Father, for your word, and Father, that you know us better than we know ourselves, God. And Father, I pray for those in this room this morning that are just, uh, just in bondage to worry, Father, that are consumed with it, that their mind cannot rest because they're concerned about tomorrow or the next week or uh, the next day are, are living in fear, Father. And God, this passage makes it clear that, that we're not to worry, and Father, that, that we need to trust you, that we need to have faith, God. And Father, I pray that, that we would see what we do now in this time as we respond, Father, that we would indeed repent of that, that, that sin of worry, God. And Father, that we indeed trust you, Father, that we, when we feel that that pull on us, God, that, that fear entering into our heart and our mind, Father, that we'd be quick to lay it down, God. So, Father, I pray right now for boldness for, for all in this room, Father, that, 
Oh, where there is worry, uh, there is sin. And so where there is sin, Father, there's a call for repentance. So that's what we do this morning, Father. I pray that we would indeed repent of the sin of worry and all other uh, sin that we've, uh, uh, we've raised against you, Father. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.